my name is Tim Price. I'm director at Price Value Partners. This presentation will show you an overview of firstly the fund that we manage. We only manage one fund, Global Equity Value Fund. And we'll also talk a bit about our investment process for our discretionary business, which is bespoke managed accounts. So our fund is called the Price Value Portfolio. Its objective is to deliver attractive long-term returns to the investor. And you can see the approach that we take on the screen there, on screen two. Essentially, we have a small amount of money invested with global specialist value managers. And increasingly, we're looking at direct investments in compelling companies. And we'll tell you a bit more about exactly how we select those. This shows you the performance of our fund since launch in 2015. That's the line in white against the FTSE in orange. So why value? I've been a value manager, it's fair to say, probably all my professional career. I started working in 91 as a bond salesman. And for the last 20 years or so, I've been managing private client money uh, on a discretionary basis. So the screen you see on slide four is from a book called What Works on Wall Street by a gentleman by the name of James O'Shaughnessy. And this is a comparatively recent book, so the, the, the figures are fairly relevant. What O'Shaughnessy did was he split the broad US market, stock market up into styles, into sectors, and then he took a 50 stock portfolio and he chose the 50 stocks, and we'll, we'll go down the list on the, on the left-hand side of the, the bar chart, he took the 50 stocks with the highest price to sales ratio and then the 50 stocks with the lowest price to sales ratio. He did the same thing with price to cash flow, price to book and price to earnings. So each year he took the 50 most expensive stocks and the 50 cheapest stocks. And then he simply rotated that or reweighted that portfolio every year so that he continually had over a period of over 50 years, the most expensive and also the cheapest stocks. OK. If you're starting, so let's choose my favorite here, which is probably price to book. I appreciate there are problems with price to book in a new digital age, but nevertheless, it's, it's particularly useful for older school type businesses like say manufacturing and mining. So let's take the, the price to book example. If you had $10,000, your starting value, and you bought the 50 stocks in the US market that had the highest price to book ratio, highest PB, your $10,000 after 50 odd years would have ended up being worth $267,000. Not bad, you might say. Then have a look at what you could have won. If you'd chosen the 50 lowest price to book stocks and continually owned them instead, your starting value of $10,000 would have ended up being worth over $22 million. Choose which, money, choose which amount of money you'd rather have. And as you can see, this metric's fairly consistent across the board. It doesn't really matter which one you use, whether it's price to sales, price to cash flow, price to book or price to earnings, it's consistent in each case. Value, for want of a better phrase, completely trounces growth over the uh, medium to longer term. This next slide, page five, shows you really more of the same. This is a more recent study by research affiliates, Rob Arnott's uh, house, uh, value house in or strategic um, consultancy business and, and fund management business in the States. And he's done the same exercise again over a period of 50 years, 1967 to 2016. So again, these figures are comparatively recent. So he split the market up into styles, value, momentum, quality and growth. Value essentially cheap stocks again, momentum being basically those stocks that are rising, uh, outperforming in the short run. Quality and growth speak more or less for themselves. The important thing, well, there's a few important things about this slide, but the one I'd, I'd highlight, first of all, is that both quality and growth actually detracted from the market. In other words, if you owned quality and growth over that period, you did less well than the market, which is something that some people would probably find staggering. The two best performing strategies were value first and then momentum. They outperformed the market. So slide six shows you a chart of a company called Seaboard Corporation, which is a company that we own in our fund and for client accounts. Seaboard is a diversified agribusiness with interests in uh, milling, shipping, uh, turkey, that, that kind of thing in the States. It's the largest turkey producer in the United States. And the, the slide shows you three, um, three lines, three lines on a shirt, ha ha. So, okay, 1995 through to 2020, um, the white line shows you the 
performance of Seaboard share price itself. The pink line shows you the performance of the S&P 500 index, broad, broad market index. And the green line shows you book value per share in Seaboard stocks, if you like Seaboard's inherent value. So a few observations from this slide. Firstly, with the benefit of hindsight, we can probably agree that Seaboard because whereas over that period generated a return of 440%, Seaboard shares, the white line, gave you a return of 1,440%. So with the benefit of hindsight, Seaboard was a great performer. But as you can also see from the, the, the white line, it's also very volatile. That's the nature of the stock market for you. Aha, but the, the, the real killer of this slide is the green line. The green line shows you growth in book value. Now we're looking at a fairly long period of time here and look how that performs. So my not so overly complicated statement is, is going to be, or conclusion is going to be over the medium term for a high quality business, the share price will track, will tend to track growth in book value. So that's the first supposition. The second is that if you're trying to market time at all, in other words, if you're trying to avoid overpaying and trying to actively seek underpaying, then simply wait until the white line trades close to or below the green line, because then you're picking up seaboard stock in this case at below its inherent value. And you'll notice that every time that's happened historically, certainly since the early 2000s, you've done very nicely over the medium term. And my thesis, my broader thesis is this, this trend recurs throughout the stock markets of the world. If you can find decently run businesses run by principled shareholder friendly managers who are excellent at capital allocation, then the share price will tend over time to track growth in inherent value, growth in book value, lather, rinse, repeat. It's not, this is not rocket surgery. Okay, page seven. I think these are some of the conventional wisdoms when it comes to value investing as, as we stand today at the tail end of 2020. It's also worth saying, and it probably will not be news to many of you, value has been a disastrous strategy relative to growth for probably the last 10 years or so. So the first thing I'd say, value, I think, is deemed to be some kind of bet against technology. So in other words, if you're betting on value stocks, you're inherently betting against big tech. I think that's the conventional view. The second conventional wisdom is that big data, the, the digitization of the world, the internet of everything, the internet of things, is leading to more value traps. In other words, those companies that are less able to participate in the digitization of things, uh, those companies will are cheap and will stay cheap forever. I refute that, but it's an open question. I think the third perspective on value is that the world has mysteriously changed, that we're now in a, a new paradigm, so we don't need to worry about um, basically companies that are involved in the old world. We only need to worry about the likes of Facebook and, and Amazon and Zoom. I don't think that's the case. I think human nature certainly never changes. The fourth observation or suspicion is that a lot of people think, well, too, ma too many people are doing it. <laughs> the idea that too many people are conducting value investing now, I find completely absurd. Virtually nobody's doing it. And certainly virtually nobody's doing it successfully. And fifthly, uh, and this is, I would suggest that the commodity sector it forms a part of the, the, the value proposition, comparatively few friends for the commodities market. Now, despite the fact it's already been rallying for some time, I had quite a, an enjoyable and explosive rally recently. But I think still the case is there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people that are wary of commodities. Okay, so here's uh, an example of value versus growth. This is 1975 through to today. This is the MSCI World Value Index of stocks relative to the MSCI World Growth Index of stocks. Two particular points on this chart leap out at you, or they should do. The first is, if anyone remembers the, the first dot-com boom, the, the peak of the first dot-com boom, that was in March 2000. And you can see where value versus growth was at the time, just a little over a ratio of one. Notice that now value versus growth is value stocks are even cheaper relative to growth or conversely, if you prefer, growth is more expensive relative to value even than it was at the height of the first dot-com bubble. I find this chart utterly astonishing. Now, it's not necessarily a good timing indicator because, you know, growth has outperformed value for some time already and it could con 
conceivably do that for some time to come, I would not make that bet personally. So what does growth really mean? Well, page nine, it's been a highly bifurcated market, at least in the States, for quite some time now. So if you wanted basically to get stellar returns for the last five years or so, you really need, needed to make two decisions. Firstly, which market do you want to own? Forget the rest of the world, you just need to own the US. And then within the US, forget the rest of the market, you just need to own the so-called FANGs. And so you can see the performance here, and the orange line shows you the return of the S&P 500, 72%. The purple line, FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and I think Microsoft included in this one. So the broad market gave you 72%, but the FANGs have given you 300% there or thereabouts. In other words, you've had extraordinary lack of market breadth. It's been a very narrowly defined market. And I'm recording this at the start of November 2020. And we've just had news of an apparently successful vaccine trial um, for coronavirus yesterday, which was the day that this news was announced, saw a, one of the biggest moves in favor of value and against growth that we've seen for, for some time, possibly forever. Um, the tide may be turning, but it's too early to, to, to draw that conclusion just yet. So what does growth really mean? Uh, as a value investor, I'm focused primarily, if not exclusively, on value from the bottom up, company specific basis. So we tend not to make macro calls about the, the global economy or macroeconomic events. We tend to look purely at bottom up value and the metrics. But here's a, a little canter through some of the more uh, famous or, for that matter, infamous growth companies, growth stocks, stocks that are perceived as growth, and this forward PE ratio. So you may recall we had a look at a slide earlier of, of, of PEs over time. Google trades on a forward PE of 28 times. That's perhaps fair because it's a quality company, but it's, it's not cheap. Amazon trades 30 times earnings. Apple trades at 23 times earnings, so that's more fairly priced. Microsoft trades at 30 times, again, a fairly punchy multiple. Facebook at 26 times, these are all punchy multiples. And then you get something like Netflix, I'm not aware that Netflix has ever made a profit in its life, 101 times earnings. Suffice to say that Netflix does not currently feature in any of our client portfolios. So what does growth really mean? I won't go through all of these, but these, this is just, again, a canter through some of the market circumstances that exist today. We've never had more debt ever in the world, and this slide was actually produced before coronavirus. So whatever is the case here now on this slide, it's got even worse since in the intervening period. We've got negative interest rates. CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, the kind of stuff that the big short, the film The Big Short was all about, they're back in the news. Low doc loans, everyone's fiddling their mortgages. Bond ratings have never been this low. US Inc. is very highly levered. It's never been this highly levered before. You can read the, uh, you know, the, the line entries here, but basically there are lots of things to be worried about. The last two I would, however, particularly highlight. There's rising mistrust of capitalism, or I think I would prefer to use the expression crony capitalism and rising support for socialism. Next question, page 12. Will modern monetary theory be the next rabbit out of the hat for policymakers? Modern monetary theory, effectively the idea that governments that can print their own money never need to borrow in the bond market, or if they do, they can borrow ad infinitum. Um, there's one word to describe MMT, and it's bollocks. Deflation versus inflation is the balance shifting. Uh, this was a recent headline from the FT. US Federal Reserve considers letting inflation run above target. Well, this has been superseded by events. The Fed is already allowing inflation. They've already effectively suspended the inflation target. They are already letting inflation run above it, notional 2% uh, CPI target. Um, the genie wants out of the bottle, may be difficult to get back in. So we've kind of been here before because the 70s was a highly inflationary decade. If, if inflation is, is ahead, well, we, we know what this film looks like, and it's called the 1970s. So this is how the, the CRB Commodity Index performed in the 1970s. And the short answer was, did very, very nicely. Thank you. Gold, of course, has been historically a great inflation hedge. But in its, in its defense, one should also be mindful of the fact that it can be a volatile ride. So although it's given you a 10% return on average over the last 40, 50 years, it can also incur drawdown. So Gold is uh, for patient investors, not for, for traders necessarily. And this is a chart of how gold's performed in various currencies. And you can see whichever currency really you, you choose, gold has had an amazing run. So there's an awful lot of green on this slide, not that much red.
So can we do the same thing in the commodity sector that we do in, in non-commodity areas? And I think the answer is yes. So we look at the resources companies or, or, or mining type businesses in exactly the same way as we would any other. The kind of things we're attracted to, a uh, history of high shareholder returns, ROE, return on equity, little or ideally no debt on the balance sheet, strong cash flow from operations, can't stress that one enough, and typically a 10% cash from operations yield, which can be calculated by uh, comparing the enterprise value of a company, the value of its equity and debt to its cash flows. Here's a few examples. This is a Western Australian miner called Romelius Resources. This is a, a stock that we own. It's done very, very nicely for us. You'll notice high, high cash flow yield, no debt to assets, high ROE. Another example, Belieden, some more industrial uh, mining concern, smelting, uh, cash from operations yield of nearly 20%. Again, very little debt, high ROE. Fresnillo, this is the world's largest silver miner, reasonable CFO yield, relatively low debt, fairly high ROE. And I make a special uh, case for Fresnillo and for silver. We particularly like the monetary metals, gold and silver. Why? Because they've always been money. And paper money, fiat currency, is being devalued at its fastest rate in history. This, this slide says now the political clouds have lifted. Well, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. They, they were when we made this presentation earlier in the year, but uh, suffice to say that the UK is still back in the game. And um, these are three, three stocks that we have owned in the fund. Uh, again, they all, they all cater to the kind of value metrics that we like. High ROE, high CFO yield, low debt to assets. And we've had mixed returns since we bought each of these. The final word is from Ben Graham, who is the master in value investing. Why not? Ben Graham, by the way, the guy who taught Warren Buffett all he knows. So the guy is the, uh, the legend, uh, literally the guy who wrote the book, The Intelligent Investor on Value Investing. Buy not on optimism, but on arithmetic. It's not about the big picture. It's about bottom up value analysis. That's the summary of the fund that we manage. And very quickly, as part of the appendices, I'll just canter through what we look through in other look we look for in other areas. We're looking for people who basically do the following things. We're looking for fund managers who think the way we do. This shows you how our discretionary portfolios typically look. The lion's share is allocated to defensive value equities or value equity funds, but we also allocate to uh, trend following funds. They're the green um, block there, real assets, monetary metals, gold and silver related things and maybe a smidgen of cash. That's a quick chart, and I appreciate we're running now, uh, a quick chart of how trend following funds, otherwise known as commodity trading advisors or CTAs have performed. The main reason we like these kind of funds is because they're uncorrelated to the stock market. And that, these show you some occasions when the market's gone down and trend following funds have actually gone up or at least been more or less flat. This is a quick recap on margin of safety, a, a key coinage of Benjamin Graham. Uh, what he's looking for in a, in, a, in a value stock. And I'd quote the line again from Ben Graham, confronted with a challenge to distill the secret of sound investing into three words, we venture the motto margin of safety. And Warren Buffett followed up 42 years after reading that, I still think those are the right three words. Why, why consider us? Why consider the approach? Why consider value investing full stop? Again, Warren Buffett. I can only tell you the secret's been out for 50 years, ever since Ben Graham and David Dodd wrote the book, yet I've seen no trend toward value investing in the 35 years that I've practiced it. There seems to be some perverse human characteristic that likes to make easy things difficult. There will continue to be wide discrepancies between price and value in the marketplace, and those who read their Ben Graham and David Dodd will continue to prosper. Amen to that. This is a quick uh, snapshot of uh, our company. It's a boutique business. Those are the three key principal staff, including myself. And the inevitable risk warning and disclaimer. Um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you like what you've seen, uh, feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much.